their week, the first six chapters of Daniel are the narratives that we're familiar with. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the Daniel and the lion's den, which is what we're going to be looking at today. And so the first six chapters are very familiar to us, but the last six chapters, beginning next week, deal with prophecy. And so beginning next week, we're going to be talking about the little bighorn, and uh, not the battle that was fought years and years ago, but the horn that is going to rise sometime in the future. And so we're going to be looking at future events Uh, beginning next week, but this morning we're in Daniel chapter 6, so if you have your Bible, why don't you go ahead and uh, turn there. Uh, We have gone through a year unlike any other year, right? Amen. (laughs) And uh, all of us have been affected in uh, different ways. People have uh, spent the year isolating themselves, and some people still are you know, have isolated themselves. And uh, when you shut yourself off, um, it produces a whole uh, different set of problems, a whole other set of problems. And uh, as I was thinking about that this week, and I was thinking about where we are uh, in the book of Daniel, there were many times in Daniel's life as well in which he had every reason uh, to be bitter against God because of the things that had happened to him. Um, And so the story of Daniel is one of faithfulness. I think if there's any word or any lesson that we can learn from Daniel, it is one of faithfulness when times are good and when times are not so good, when we receive good news and when we receive bad news. You remember Daniel was taken from his family at a young age. Uh, We don't know what happened to his family. Probably many of them were killed. Among them were his mom and dad his friends, uh, those who he went to school with. But you remember he went to Babylon, carried off into exile along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so we've seen each and every story where Daniel comes up or his three friends come up. It is always one of faithfulness to God. It didn't matter the circumstance that they were in, their focus remained on Jehovah God. And last week we saw in chapter 5, The Babylonian kingdom finally coming to an end. Uh, Its last king was a man by the name of Belshazzar. You remember he held a feast for all of his nobles. In fact, there was a thousand of them that came. And to make the party liven up a little bit, they brought the wine and, of course, all the women. And he came up with this idea to bring out all of the sacred objects that Solomon had made and Nebuchadnezzar had placed in their temple. And so they brought out all of the silver and golden goblets and uh, they poured them with wine and they begin to drink and and praise the gods of gold and silver and wood and and precious stones and all of a sudden in the midst of their partying what happened there is this hand that kind of came out of nowhere and the fingers then began to write on the wall and the scriptures tell us in chapter 5 that that Belshazzar's knees weakened and they knocked it together because he couldn't read what was written and obviously he couldn't interpret it as well and so he called all of his wise men to come and see if they could read what was written up there and also interpret it but none of them could. And all of a sudden, mom comes out. Mom's always to the rescue, right? The queen mom comes out and she says, ah, there is a man in your kingdom. You don't know about him. Perhaps you've forgotten about him. His name is Daniel. She uses the Hebrew name Daniel right there. And because she remembers... Uh, what Daniel had done before. And so Daniel is brought uh, now to the forefront, and um, he always showed courteousness when he dealt with Nebuchadnezzar, but with Belshazzar he didn't. Daniel at this point is in his 80s, and he said, listen, king, uh, here's what it says. And he read the writing, and he also interpreted it, and the interpretation was, you know what, you're out of here, king. You're out of here, and the king is the kingdom is done. And of course, we read last week that that's exactly what happened. The Medes and the Persians came in. Uh, this impenetrable for- fortress known as Babylon, they came in, and Belshazzar was killed. And Darius now assumes the leadership uh, with the Medes and the Persians. And so we don't know what happened to Daniel at, at this particular point. Um, as far as because you remember because he interpreted the writing he was made third in command well that was under the old regime 
But now the re- new regime is in, and so perhaps Daniel or Darius had uh, heard about Daniel and all of the great exploits and what he had survived, and uh, we don't know. But when we come here to chapter 6, it's perhaps maybe a year or two later after Darius now assumes control uh, of the kingdom. And of course, his goal now is to try to unify the kingdom, right? He's king of the world. And all of these different kingdoms that he had defeated or that his predecessor had defeated, he now is in charge of. And so the trick now is to organize everything under one head and one under one leadership. And so this is what begins to happen here in chapter 6. And so get ahead and look at verse 1. Verse 1 says, So it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, these guys would have been governors or rulers of provinces, to be over the whole kingdom. And over these 120 satraps were three governors. Among them, of one of them, was Daniel, so that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no particular loss. And so uh, Darius, we know according to history, was an organizer. And so one of the first things he does then is to organize the kingdom. And so he splits it up into 120 different um, sectors. And above those 120 would be three governors who then would be in charge of them to make sure that everything is done on the up and up there in uh, the kingdom. And of course, Daniel was one of these uh, three uh, governors. In fact, uh, this would be unusual, first of all, because Daniel was Jewish. Uh, he was one from one of the conquered kingdoms, and he was well advanced in years. You remember Daniel at this point is probably in his mid 80s. And you know, sometimes you see a picture of Daniel, and we see this young man, and he's very old. Well, at this particular point, and in one of the greatest stories, I believe, in the Bible, which we're going to be looking at, Daniel now is in his uh, mid 80s. And of course, you can't blame Darius. Um, Daniel was exceptional in his leadership. He was an exceptional in his own organizational skills, and he had a reputation that preceded him. And so Darius now had um, placed him now very, very, very high up in this new kingdom. Verse 3 says, and then this Daniel's distinguished himself above all of the governors and the satraps. And because an excellent spirit was in him, the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Now, what do you think everyone else thought about that? I don't think so. We've dealt with this before, right? The jealousy and the anger and the bitterness from the wise men and all of those in whom Daniel was in charge. And so Darius looks at Daniel. He heard of his reputation, but he sees also that he has organizational skills. And so he has in his mind and as a goal to set Daniel over everyone except for himself. And um, I thought, and to me, this is amazing. Uh, We know that Daniel kept an unbelievable testimony for God. In the the midst of a secular world, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who at the beginning was very cruel, and the Medes and the Persians the same way, and here's Daniel now placed in an unbelievably high position, but yet he maintains his faith in Jehovah God. And so verse 4 says, And so the other governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault. I love that about Daniel. They looked and they observed him very, very carefully to see if he was making any mistakes so that they could go to the king and say, King, listen, you guys, you, you don't want this guy in charge, right? Because he makes all of these mistakes. Well, they observe him and they can't find anything wrong. Because he was faithful, the Bible says. They could find no wrong because he was faithful. I believe he was faithful in two ways. Number one, he was faithful to God. And number two, he was faithful to his job. He just did it right. So it doesn't matter. Why? Because we as believers, when we work, we work to please who? We work to please God. So if you have an employer that's not so pleasant, guess what? It doesn't matter. Because I'm not working for him. Well, I am. Um, But I'm really working who? 
for Jesus Christ, right? Because he is the one that I want to please. And so this was Daniel's lifestyle. He was faithful because he worked hard. He was trustworthy, but he was also faithful to God as well. And so the governors and satraps, they try to find something that was wrong with him so that they could accuse him so that they could be promoted. That was their goal, right? Well, then these men said, we cannot find any charge against this Daniel unless unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. You remember, this is a godless culture right here. Okay, they don't worship the, the Jehovah God, the one true God. And so, you know what? The only way they're going to make any kind of charge stick against Daniel is to find something wrong with him, which will go against what uh, Darius believes. And so now they're going to look concerning his faith. Daniel was a man of integrity. He was a man of integrity from the time he was a teenager. Remember chapter 1? He, he, he had, had purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself against Jehovah God from the time he was young. Man, he must have had some unbelievable upbringing. Or the school that he was in had to be unbelievably uh, tremendous in schooling him on, on taking a stand for Jehovah God because Daniel was the man as far as doing that. And uh, you know what? I believe... I believe that biblical principles work universally. When you work hard, guess what? You're going to be honored for working hard. If you work, you're going to eat, right? The Bible says that. Well, that's a universal principle. And so Daniel, here's Daniel, a strong believer in Jehovah God, working in the midst of a godless culture, but yet here he is at the top. Why? Because he was faithful to God and because he was faithful into the job in which God had called him. You know what? When we stand before God, uh, it's not going to be, well done, thou good and rich servant. It's not going to be, well done, thou good and successful servant. It's going to be what? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Were you faithful to the gifts and talents and abilities that God gave you when you crossed that line of faith? That's what he's going to judge you on. Were you faithful to what God has given you? I don't know many of you are. I've observed you in your lives at work and here at church, and you are. And God honors that. And, uh, and God will honor this as Daniel as well. Look at verse 6. And so these governors and satraps thronged before the king. How do you think they approached him? Oh, king, oh, loving king. I mean, they're buttering up big time. They thronged him. They came to him excitedly before the king and said thus to him, Oh, King Darius, live forever. They're trying to soften him up, right? They're trying to soften him up to listen to what they have to say to them. And uh, listen, people will grumble and criticize whatever you do. So you know what? If I'm going to do it, I better do it right. Because they're going to grumble and complain anyway, right? And so here's Daniel living above board, being faithful to God, being faithful to this job. And here are these people that are grumbling and complaining uh, against him. And people, listen, when people complain, they'll always find other people to go along with them. Those of you who are on Wednesday night are studying the book of Numbers. When one person complains, what happens? All of a sudden, you begin drawing all the complainers around you. And so this is what happens now. The governors and the satraps get together. They don't like Daniel because of who he is. And so they've now concocted a plan, and they come before the king. Verse 7 says this, So all of the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and the satraps, the counselors and advisors, this is what they're telling Darius, have, we have all consulted together to establish a royal statute or a royal law and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or any man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. You see what they're doing here? And now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. And so here's the plan. And you know they met behind the scenes. Man, we can't find anything wrong with Daniel. Let's see if we can't find something wrong uh, with his, what he believes. And so they observed Daniel. They knew his habits from early morning until night. And so you know what? Let's do this. Let's come before for the king, let's butter him up first, and let's ask him then to make a law which says, if any man for the next 30 days prays to anyone besides you, let him be thrown into the den 
of lions. Now, why just 30 days? Well, any longer than 30 days, it would have been a drudgery, right? People would have begun to complain. And so 30 days seems to be the right amount of, of time. And 30 days obviously would be enough time for them to catch Daniel in an act that would go against this law uh, of the Medes and the Persians. Now, understand this, that when Nebuchadnezzar was king in Babylon, he was the law. He was the bottom line. But under the king of the Medes and the Persians, their laws were the bottom line, and even the king had to submit to it. And so if a law was made, it doesn't matter who made it, the king on down, they had to obey the law, and there was no turning back. That was the law of the Medes and the Persians. And so they're trying to get now uh, um, Darius to make this law that if anyone prays to anyone else except you, they shall be cast into the den of lions. And once it becomes law, even you, king, now they didn't tell him that, even you, king, have to obey that law as well. Verse 9, look what happens. And so therefore King Darius signed the written decree. Why do you think he signed it? What did it appeal to? You think kind of appealed to his pride? Hey, everybody's going to be praying to me now, you know. Not that head of gold, not that Nebuchadnezzar, but they're going to be praying now. At least for 30 days, they're going to recognize me as, as a deity. And of course, he agreed to sign because he wanted to bring unity to the kingdom. And if there's only one God, him, and if everyone prays to that God, well, then that brings unity uh, to the kingdom. He needed to encourage, and he needed to be encouraged in this, and so this seemed like a reasonable plan, and so he signs it. It's now law. It's now the law of the Medes and the Persians. Verse 10, and so when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he ran away. Is that what he did? <laughs> no. He, when he knew it was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since the early days. And so Daniel was a man of what? He was a man of prayer. The Bible says the prayer of a righteous man are powerful and they're effective. And so Daniel apparently, according to this, has done this from the time he was a young teenager. So from the time that he first came into Babylon, he would open up the windows of his house and he would pray uh, to Jehovah God three times a day. Uh, David tells us in the book of Psalms, I will call upon the Lord and the Lord shall save me evening and morning and at noon I will pray and I will cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. Interesting. In spite of the fact that this decree now is made law and it cannot be turned around, Daniel still does it. Doesn't matter what the law is. I believe there's a time and a place where a believer has to obey God rather than man. How many of you know what I'm talking about? If the world ever says that we can't meet here in this church, guess what? We're meeting here in this church. I don't care if the church moves out into the graveyard, we're going to still meet. We will always continue to preach the Word of God from cover to cover, from Genesis right through Revelation. Always, as long as I'm here, right? Unless you vote me out, and if somebody else comes in, then that's different. But I will always preach the gospel, and we will always always remain open and preach the truth of God's Word. And so here's Daniel. He's faced with this law. He's faced with, faced with death, but yet he chooses to do and to honor his God by praying. He didn't change his lifestyle because his life was in danger. He didn't do that at all. He considered his relationship with Jehovah God more important than a law that came down. And so here we are. Here's Daniel, and he's praying. And don't you know the tattletales are outside? Don't you know they have their cell phones and, and they're recording everything that's, that Daniel's doing? They've got their binoculars out and they want to make sure that they have all of the evidence that they need so that when they go back to Darius that they'll be able to accuse him. And, um, and, and so here we are. And so I wonder what Daniel prayed. Oh God, please save me. I don't think so. I think it's just like he prayed just like before. He thanked God. Uh, I mean, he's brought him now 80 plus years to where he is now. He's promoted him to second in command of the kingdom. I thank God, thank you for the opportunity that you gave me up to this point. Even if I face death, I will not dishonor your name. 
I love that. I love his faithfulness there. And so someone once said, with hurricanes and floods and tornadoes, mudslides, forest fires, gas shortages, <laughs> severe thunderstorms tearing up the country from one end to the other, and with the threat of COVID and terrorist attacks, are we sure this is a good time to take God out of our public culture? <laughs> I don't think so, right? So here's Daniel in the midst of a godless culture and in the midst of an edict that, that comes down that says, if you don't worship or pray to the king, you will die. He just continues on as before, right? And he prays to God. Verse 11, and then these men assembled, You're right, they, they were already there, right? And they found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. They'd probably been there all week. You know, we saw him do it the first day. Well, let's just give him another day. And so this is what Daniel did on a daily basis. And so they went then before the king. Here's the little tattletales coming now to the king. Oh, king, they spoke to the king concerning the decree. King, by the way, have you not signed a law that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O oh, king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, This thing is true, he doesn't know what they're at yet, right? This thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. They made him repeat it, right? They went to him, oh, King, repeat to us the law that you signed and agree to us that it is the lead, a law of the Medes and the Persians and that everyone has to obey that. And so this is what happens. You remember, the king now is subject to the law that he just, that he just signed. And so is Daniel, right? And so all of a sudden, verse 13, and so they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, I can imagine the finger, that Daniel, that Daniel, you know, who is the one of the captives from Judah, who does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. In other words, they've observed, hey, listen, he still prays to his God three times a day. Uh-uh. The law says that they have to pray to you. So what's the king thinking? He's mad, maybe. He's thinking, why would Daniel do that? Look at what happens next verse. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with who? With himself. Darn, why did they sign that law? That's what he's thinking. Why, why did they allow, I allow them to trick me like this? And he was displeased with himself, and he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver them. And then these men approached the king and said to the king, at the end of the day, I'm sure, O king, that is the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no decree or statute which the kings established may be cha uh, changed. And so the king spent all day trying to find a way out. I believe that even in this short period of time, uh, Darius and Daniel had established a relationship. Darius noticed something different about this man who was faithful to his God and successful in everything that he did. He saw his testimony. Maybe not heard it, but he saw his testimony. I thought to myself, you know what? Ought that not to be for us as believers? The people that see us throughout the week, they not only ought to see, but also to hear the fact that we believe in Jesus Christ and that he is the most important thing in our lives, that he is the focal point of our lives. And listen, people may make fun of you, People may down you for it, but I'll tell you what, as soon as they're in trouble, guess who the first person they're going to be coming to? It's going to be you. Why? Because they know that there's something solid right there and that they need it. And so this is what's happening here. They go before the king and they accuse that Daniel. And, and Darius was displeased with himself. He was angry at himself because he had been hoodwinked, so to speak. He had been tricked into signing this law. And he saw right through uh, what these governors and satraps were trying to do. And I thought, you know what? That's how Satan does it, does he not? Satan is a deceiver. Satan is a distorter. Satan is a divider. And Satan Satan is a destroyer, and he will do anything in his power to render you ineffective in your stand for Jesus Christ. And he'll use trickery, he'll use people, he'll use whatever means to try to render you ineffective. And so it's my job to what? To stay true to the Word of God, to remain faithful to God. That takes discipline, that takes hard work. I want to sin, <laughs> I want to have fun. I mean, that's the flesh, is it not? 
But it takes discipline and hard work to take a stand and to remain faithful uh, to Jesus Christ. And so the king looks away uh, to, to, to bring Daniel out from this, but uh, there is no way. And uh, the accusers got him, so to speak. Don't you know they're happy? Aha, we got them now. We're going to get rid of Daniel, and then we'll be elevated now in the kingdom. Verse 16, and so the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel, and they cast him into the den of lions. Now, the den was probably um, a hill or a mound and, and had an opening at the top, and there was probably a way that you could observe or let the lions in and out from the side. And so Daniel was taken up, and then he was placed probably that down by rope because he's in his 80s now into the lion's den. But it's interesting what the king said. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Now, how would Darius know that? Except by observing the life of Daniel. Listen, I know the God that you serve, and you serve him all of the time. He will deliver you. Now, did he say that with a question? He will deliver you, right? Or he will deliver you, no exclamation point. And, uh, and so, and then when he says that, verse 17 says, And then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, so he would know later on who signed on, right? And, and, uh, and that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. So I, I love those series of verses there because um, Darius kind of relents to the law. He signed that law. So Daniel was brought. Daniel now is lowered into uh, the lion's den. Now, these lions were kept hungry, right? So that whatever food was offered to them, they're not going to refuse. Do you ever get really, really, really hungry? It's just like everything that you see you want to eat. Yesterday was one of my eating days. I ate everything. I mean, everything that was there, I ate. And Karen says, you, this must be one of your eating days. And it was. You just, some days you just want to eat everything. Well, these lions were kept hungry. These were hungry lions. And so when they saw this piece of meat coming down from above, don't you know the first thing they wanted to do was what? was to chomp down and, and get their meal. But, uh, but I still love what Darius had to say. Your God, who, who, who you serve continually, he will save you. And so Daniel is dropped in. Uh, the, the, the stone now is placed over uh, the, the lion's den. Um, uh, and, and Darius will then go back to his... Uh, his castle for the night. Uh, do you think he'll sleep that night? I don't think so. Did he think Daniel was already dead? Did he st even stick around as Daniel was placed into the den? Because usually when you were stick in, uh, you were taken before you even hit the bottom. Uh, did he even stick around for that point or did he just uh, pronounce the sentence and then turn around and go uh, the other way? No escape. Uh, there's no rescue. The seal is placed there. All of those who agreed, their seal was placed as well. And so there's Daniel all night in the lion's den. I mean, what would you do? What was, that, what was it like there? This is where my imagination just really begins to grow wild. I mean, there were no lights in there. He couldn't just flick on a switch and say, hey, lions, how you doing? It was dark. He would have been sitting there. And lions being what they are, lions, you, do you think they came up and kind of sniffed him just to kind of, you know, just to kind of, hmm, tender, yeah, a little tough, you know? I mean, they're lions, right? And you're sitting there and, and you're praying. And if I was Daniel, I'd be praying really hard, you know? And, and what was he praying? You know, God deliver me, help it not to hurt too much. Uh, did Daniel know going in that he was already going to escape? Uh, we don't know. But he's human, right? Just like us. Daniel is not deity. He was just human. And so there he is sink, uh, sinking down into the den and, and, and sitting there and, and the lions all around him. And uh, were they nudging up against him? Were they friendly lions? That's the title of our sermon. But were they friendly? They were friendly to Daniel, right? I guess. What was, he, what was, he, was he singing? Was he praying? Psalm 139 says, where can I go from your spirit? Where come I free, flee from your presence? 
If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Was he singing that? Was he saying that as he's sitting there and, and praying and the lions are kind of hanging out? And, and, or did they, go to, did they take their naps? I don't know. We can talk hours on that. My imagination is really going wild. But there they are. There's Daniel now in the lion's den. Verse 18 says, And the king went to his palace and spent the night partying. Right? <laughs> no, no, no. And he spent the night fasting. And no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. So I'm sure he went to bed early, but there was no sleep going on. There might have been partying going on in the governor's tents, but there was no partying going on in Darius's tent. He was alone. No musicians tonight. No entertainment tonight. Just let me by myself. And so was he praying? Was he praying to his gods? Was he thinking about Daniel's testimony? Was he thinking about, oh, I hope they don't hurt him too much or if if they did attack him I hope it was quick so that he didn't suffer all of these things I'm sure going through this a man who didn't know Jehovah God uh, but had heard about him and saw him through Daniel and so here he was now spending uh, a sleepless night he was angry at himself he was angry at his accusers probably thinking how can I get back at these accusers for me losing Daniel and uh, all of these thoughts going through his mind. Verse 19, And then the king arose very early in the morning, morning and went in haste to the den of lions. Now, why would he go? If a person was eaten even before they reached the bottom, why would they go to the, why would they go to the den of lions? Why would they? I think in the back of his mind, he knew. He knew that Daniel had been rescued. And he hurried, went in haste. In other words, he was running. All you saw was Sneaker and Heine. He was just moving, moving as he was running now towards uh, the den of lions. And when he came uh, to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice. So it wasn't excitement. It was just, oh, Daniel, sort of like that. Uh, he said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God. I love how he introduces Daniel there. Servant of the living God, living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And you can imagine that, that silence right there after he mentioned that statement. Is he thinking Daniel's really going to answer me? Is he thinking Daniel's going to say, hey, get me out of here. You know, I'm tired of being in here. He didn't know what to think. He's there at the, at, at the entrance where you're able to see into the den. It's still dark at us very early uh, in the morning. Has your God, Daniel, whom you serve continually, has he been able to deliver you from the mouth of uh, the lions? You see, Daniel's allegiance was not to the king, but was to who? Was to Jehovah God. And so I believe that there was this tremendous moment of silence. Maybe Daniel's thinking, nah, I'm going to let him sweat a little bit <laughs> before I answer. You know, and so the king is waiting anxiously. And then all of a sudden, verse 21, and then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. Do you see the, the respect that Daniel has for leadership? This is a secular king. This is secular who's a pagan king. Uh, doesn't believe in Jehovah God, but sees something different in Daniel. Oh, king. Um, oh, king, live forever. Darius's ears perk up. Yeah, I'm missing an arm and a couple of uh, legs, but I'm okay, Darius. No, none of that. My God sent his angel and shut the mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have nothing, done nothing wrong before you. And so there's the confession right there. And I'm wondering if the satraps and governors were there, if they're thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> we've been caught right now, because here's Daniel now. He's still alive after spending all night there in uh, the lion's den, and, and he hears Daniel's voice. And I'm sure maybe he's looking inside to see if it's really Daniel who's talking and not some person on uh, the outside. And, and he, he gives respect to the king, and then he gives glory to God. God has, has sent his mighty angel to, to shut the mouths of the lions. And I wonder who that angel was. I often wonder, Gary, that maybe perhaps this was Jesus Christ himself. 
You remember Jesus was right there, in the, I believe, in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and the Abednego. And so there's Daniel, there's Jesus, and there's all the lions. Right? I mean, God created them, right? He can do what he wants with the animals. And so there they are. I wonder what they talked about all night. Was the angel or Jesus there all night? What kind of conversation did they have? How neat that would have been. You know, just put on that tape recorder just, just to hear what Jesus had to say to Dan. Don't worry, Daniel. I got this. I got your back. Now, angels, not only protect you behind, but also before and on either side of you. Don't worry. You're going to be delivered. Verse 23 says, so, by the way, the man of integrity walks securely. You know, when you live an integrous life before God, you just walk with your head held high. Well, not because you're proud, not because you have pride, but because you know whom you have believed. And you've been persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That allows me to walk with my head held high and to walk securely. Verse 23, and now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. And so Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. And so if you can imagine that scene, the rope is, is lowered for Daniel. He probably puts it under his arms you know, with some padding there, and they begin to lift him out, and the lions are saying, darn, we missed a meal, you know, as they're watching Daniel going up and, and out of, of the lion's den. But when he comes out, the king examines him and there's not a scratch there's no blood running at all God had delivered him he, because, I love it there because he believed in his God again Darius notices that it's because of his belief in Jehovah God verse 24 and the king gave the command now here's where it gets dicey and the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel the law was void right null and void and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all of their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. What a sight that meant. Back then, one of the laws of the Medes and the Persians, if you were guilty, your whole family was guilty. And so everyone suffered the same consequence as you did. Uh, so this is what happens here. I mean, the lions, met, they waited all night, right? They hadn't eaten yet. Okay, here comes a lot of meals coming down. And so it does. I mean, it, we can make light of it, but this is serious. I mean, the, all of the families then are being uh, taken away because of the sin of pride, right? Because of the sin of pride. They were eaten before they even hit the ground. The Bible says in, in Galatians, whatever a man sows, he what? He also reaps. Whatever a man sows, he also reaps. But God also protects the innocent. And also, when you sin, you don't sin alone, do you? When you sin, it always affects someone else. And we see in this particular case, these governors and safe traps, and uh, their families paid the price as well. Verse 25 says this, and then Darius wrote this, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on all of the earth, peace be multiplied to you. What's the only way to find peace today? Through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came, and because of Jesus, now we have peace. The angel said, peace on earth. Peace, you remember, is the joining of the two sides together, God and man. And what bridges that gap? Jesus Christ. And so he is the author of peace. Peace uh, be multiplied to you. Verse 26, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he is steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. Now, how did he know this? Daniel probably preached to him before, before this time. And all of a sudden, he's seeing the evidence in front of him. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Now, always the question is, and we saw this with Nebuchadnezzar, was this a true conversion right here? Or was he just impressed with God's delivering power? We don't know. But at this particular point, he gives glory to who? He gives glory to Jehovah God. Um, you see... 
throughout the short time that he had known each other, Darius recognized something different about Daniel. He recognized that this Daniel continually served and worshipped the, the God that he believed in, Jehovah God. Uh, and now he had seen it firsthand. He had heard the stories about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He had heard the stories about Daniel interpreting those dreams for Nebuchadnezzar. But now he is seeing it for the first time right in front of him. God's miraculous delivering power. Verse 28 says, And so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persians, the Medes and the Persians, right? And so Daniel continues on. Kingdoms change, leaders change. But listen, the man of God, the person who places faith and trust in God through Jesus Christ will endure through all of that. Whatever the changes are, whatever happens, listen, whatever happens in our country, Jesus Christ is the same. My faith in Him does not change. Why? Because the same Holy Spirit when times are good is the same Holy Spirit that lives inside of me when times are not as good. And so I choose to to believe on Him. Why? Because He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I think if there's one lesson um, that that I've learned in these six chapters is, is one of faithfulness. And we see Daniel rising to the forefront on four or five different occasions here, whether it's interpreting a dream or whether his three friends are delivered from a fiery furnace, or in this particular case when Daniel is delivered from the lion's den, we see that when the spotlight is shown on them during these few times that they are faithful to God and God delivers them. But I want to say to you, and I've, I've, I think I've told you this before, that the majority of their lives were lived beyond the spotlight. And in, in order for them to be successful when the spotlight was on them, they had to be living a life that was continually faithful to God when the spotlight was off. Do you understand what I mean? in order then to be effective when the, when the light shone on them. If Daniel just lived the life of a sinner and all of a sudden he's thrown into the lion's den, guess what? He's breakfast for those, for those lions, right? But you see, Daniel lived consistently faithful before God. And so when the spotlight was shown on him to publicly be faithful, he was already ready. He didn't have to prepare himself. Why? Because he had developed the habit of being faithful to God. And that is our lives. The majority, guess what? The majority of our lives, I call it living between the lines. When the spotlight is off. When the Monday morning hits and you're at work and you face the same disagreeable boss, unless you're the boss, right? The same disagreeable boss or, boss or someone that you don't like that you work with and, and, and it's drudgery and all of a sudden you're back to... Back to reality. Then all of a sudden, a day or weeks or a month or two down the line, the spotlight shines where you have to be faithful to God. Well, guess what? If I was faithful to God during those mundane moments in my life, when the spotlight hits, it doesn't matter. My life is going to be the same. My lifestyle is going to be the same. So that's, I believe, the lesson that I learned in Daniel. The majority of his life was spent between those chapters. We don't know what he did. All we know that he did do was that he remained faithful to God. He prayed three times a day so that when the spotlight came on and he had to take a stand, he didn't have to prepare himself. He was already ready. He was ready to go. And because of that, God delivered him in an unbelievable way. And I think that's the challenge to all of us, to me, is that we would remain faithful to God no matter what the circumstances are. I don't know what the future holds. We're going to be looking at the future in the weeks and months ahead. I don't know what that holds. But, and you've heard this, but we know who holds the future, right? God, Jesus Christ. And so he's the one that I'm going to remain faithful to. I don't care who becomes president. I don't care who's governor. I'm going to vote correctly. But who cares what gets in? I serve Jesus Christ. He's the one that I obey. Because guess what? There's an eternity that waits for me 
And I want to make sure that when I stand before him, that he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. Amen. Bill.